welcome everyone to another episode of Two Geeks and a Marketing Podcast. As always, we're here to keep you up to date with the latest news, tech, content and wisdom from the world of marketing. Let me introduce you to my co-host. He's a man on a mission to demystify digital marketing. The host of the Content Marketing Studio video podcast, I give you Mr. Pascal Fintoni. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. Can I just say it is a pleasure every single week to spend time in your company. You, a man on a mission to keep marketing simple, the voice of the marketing and finance podcast and the host of the Rod Dog video series, I give you Monsieur Roger Edwards. Excellent. Thank you so much, Pascal. And thank you so much to everybody who watches the podcast and to everyone who listens to the podcast, and especially those of you who give us feedback. Now, Pascal, this week we got a really nice shout out, didn't we? We did. So yeah, we got a shout out from a company over in the States in the San Francisco area, Allison and Partners. Now their guy, Andrew Rogers, has written a blog post, which is seven UK marketing podcasts you should subscribe to in 2021. And Two Geeks the Marketing Podcast is on that. That list, along with, and I'm really pleased with this, Marketing Week, you know, which is the, <laughs> the big, big UK uh, marketing publication. So, wow, it really feels good. So thanks to Alison and Partners. Thanks to Andrew Rogers. No, thank you very much. Yeah, it, it, no, this is what we do. It we, we do it because we enjoy spending time together. We're passionate by the profession that is to make sure your marketing is done right. But for others to just give a little thumbs up, it's uh, indeed very special. So thank you again to Alison and partners. So Pascal, shall we head straight into the news? Sky has announced a new climate conscious campaign called the Sky Zero Footprint Fund. Brands and creative agencies with the most impactful idea will be awarded £1 million in advertising fund. The World Federation of Advertisers, the WFA, has released an open source guide to help address advertising's diversity and representation gaps. It identifies 12 key areas in the creative funnel where bias can occur. Netflix has launched the Irregulars and brought part of the show to life in an iconic part of London with a strap line and unkindness of ravens has descended on Baker Street, a darkness is coming to London. Fast food brand KFC has been trying out various slogans made famous by the likes of Marmite, Specsavers and Nike in a local social media campaign. So much fun. Now, Instagram has released many new features recently, including a product called Remix with its TikTok copycat reels, which precisely copies a TikTok duet. Snapchat is working on the latest version of its spectacles, enabling users to view augmented reality through their glasses without needing a smartphone. Vodafone has kickstarted a 12-month advertising program with a new tagline, Together We Can, and a new message that a partnership between technology and society can build a better future. Beer brand Corona has launched a multi-sensory campaign from the natural world, which highlights that the beer is brewed with 100% natural ingredients and recounts how the power of nature connects individuals with their best selves. So, Pascal, <laughs> I had to laugh when I read that last piece of news. I mean, way back when the pandemic started, I think a lot of people uh, actually quite stupidly thought that the beer brand Corona was something to do with the coronavirus. Um, I mean, how dumb can some people be? But when I saw this, it did sort of ring a few alarm bells for me because didn't the coronavirus supposedly come from the natural world and crossed species from animals to to man mm. and and they're running a campaign which is from the natural world i just wondered whether they're setting themselves up for another bit of misinterpretation here or certainly a nice selection of memes as is often the case with in this yes. kind of advertising campaign do you know th this week or oh, this segment is always full of surprises um, mm -hmm. we've stumbled upon a new tongue twister and tiktok copycat reels um, yes and I don't know about you, but uh, come on, Instagram or Facebook. Do you know, can you do something uh, more exciting? I know they've done some interesting things with regard to Instagram stories as part of the package of new releases. But to for the news headlines, to simply say you are a TikTok copycat, it's not really where, where you want to be. No, it, it, it baffles me. I mean, yes, you obviously want to share in the success that's 
that people have. And obviously TikTok has been phenomenally successful, but it's absolute blatant copying, isn't it? And I, I do wonder whether TikTok haven't got an army of lawyers swarming all over <laughs> this to see if there's anything they can do about it. I mean, okay, you, you can't patent or copyright ideas. You can copyright products, but you know, the, the, the way that they are, that uh, uh, Instagram is ripping off everybody else is so blatant. Maybe they've just gr Facebook has grown so big that they just they just don't think anybody will take them on. But you know what's interesting? I've subscribed to the um, TikTok business newsletter out of interest mm -hmm. to keep myself informed. It is rather good, and I would uh -huh. argue much better than Instagram business, which actually doesn't have an e newsletter to to my knowledge. So, what is nice about the TikTok business newsletter? They are saying clearly, we are your kind of partner for B two C marketing, and this is what we do better. This is you know where we're not really uh, right for you as a match, and it just feels. Is oddly for what the content is. I find the TikTok business newsletter to be very calm, very logical, very easy to follow. So, no, good luck to them. I think we need diversity for sure in the marketplace. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I keep ignoring TikTok. I think I've I've got about three videos on there and about six <laughs> followers. Uh, and I do think sometimes maybe I should give it a little bit more time and a little bit more effort just to try to understand what works or doesn't. So, so Netflix has launched this new series called The Irregulars, which is actually, um, it's another sort of take on Sherlock Holmes. Uh, now, in one of um, Arthur uh, Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes novels, there are a series of characters called the Irregulars, and effectively it's uh, uh, street urchins and, and kids that roam the street in London are effectively the eyes and ears of Sherlock Holmes, and they feed him information. And the Irregulars is a Netflix series about those kids. Um, but the, this, this marketing image that they've come up with, with these hundreds of ravens, which effectively descend out of the sky and take roost outside uh, 21 uh, B Baker Street is actually a really spooky image. Now, I couldn't find anything to say whether they were real ravens or whether they'd, <laughs> they'd put them in using something like After Effects or something like that. Um, but obviously, you know, that there's the great big uh, tale of doom and gloom that if the ravens ever leave the Tower of London the kingdom will fall. Well, if they could persuade all the ravens that they used in this trailer to move to the Tower of London, I think we'd be okay for quite a while. I mean, two things about, you know, marketing. I like it when, again, it's creative and, and smart, but also it makes you smarter yourself because I didn't know it was called unkindness of ravens. So for the next yes. kind of pub quiz, uh, I'll, be, I'll be ready. But I love this idea of doing something very visual. So I think for memory, it was a, uh, for a few days only, they had you know fake ravens taking over the uh, 21, 221B and also the tube station. So they were there. Mm. So of course, mm. people who can travel and do work in London snapped away and created a bit of a social media sensation because at first when i saw the news i said well, what's the point of creating a um essentially an exhibition of sort at a time where we are in lockdown but of course i always forget the power of the math marketing in this situation and now you know normal kind of media as well as marketing media i've covered the story yeah yeah there's, there's some really <laughs> some really good stuff in the news this week and again uh, you know, we talked about TikTok and, and um, Instagram copying them, but I like the story about KFC. Yeah, me too. Now, what the, what what they've done is they've effectively um, like parked up a van with a with a, a, a digital display um, on its side outside of the Nike store in London, and you've got the red of the KFC branding and the KFC logo, but the strap line they've actually put onto this digital display is just do it which is the the nike slogan and of course they've done this with marmite and spec savers and, and i think it's more of a it's like a photo opportunity for social media isn't it mm. as opposed to a, a specific tv campaign or anything like that but on the one hand i think it's actually quite brave on the on the other hand maybe these other brands won't take too kindly to it either so uh i don't think it, it's in the same category of, of copying as as instagram and tiktok but i think it is an interesting idea no, but I think it was done with uh, much wit and and yes. and kind of um, 
Yeah, there, there was something actually quite endearing by this idea of well, we can't use finger licking good, uh, as you mentioned yes. uh, yourself in one of the um, in the news spotlight. And what else can we do? And there's almost kind of putting a call out to the nation, but also to the other brands and creating again some kind of conversation and i know that the social media managers of nike and all the others kind of jumped on and say maybe not but so there was some lovely kind of conversation done uh, in in a good way whereas i think yep. the instagram kind of rip off of tiktok is not is not in you know, the same ilk uh, whatsoever which then, no, I agree. Which leads me on to asking your reaction to the Vodafone. So together we can, I've seen the adverts now on TV as well, and this message of, you know, technology and society can build a better future. So I'm I'm torn with this one. You know, should we say to Vodafone, you know, just be a telecom company and stop, you know, pretending you can have a campaign uh, as grand as this one? Or actually, no, you know, companies should have a stance on something. But also, are we seeing that, are we seeing that Vodafone's an example of many where they're seeing the backlash against, you know, the big brands like Amazon, Facebook, Google, and so on, and they want to create a bit of distance? Yeah, I mean, I, I, Vodafone's a bit a bit marmite, isn't it? I guess uh, people love them or hate them. I mean, I, my mobile phone provider is Vodafone. I've personally never had a problem with them, okay. but I know that some people have had endless hassle, and their customer service has a reputation for being absolutely appalling when things go wrong, and it, when they introduce a strap line like "Together We Can." You absolutely know that they've got to have things nailed in the background. You know, you can't do things together if your customer service is not up to scratch. So I, I, I hope that they've that they've got that nailed before they start using that that strap line. But I would agree with you. I think that I, I th you know, I think it's there's a lot of you know the sky, sky are doing this zero footprint and and the the corona brand are doing it from the natural world again they they're, they're hopping on to some of these social issues and we've said it before on the show i think there was a news item last week that if you're going to do that you've got to put some money behind it rather than just play, pay lip service mm. to it so it does seem to me that they are actually putting their money where their mouth is here super well well yeah. as you mentioned a, a really a fine selection of news items yeah, and I think we should probably move on, Pascal. And the next part of the show is one of my favourites, and that is the content spotlights. In this section of the show, Pascal and I bring to the table a piece of content. It could be an article, it could be a video, it could be a podcast. And the great thing about this is we don't warn each other in advance about that piece of content, so it's always a surprise. So, Pascal, what have you got for me? This so this week, for you in particular, as well as for our viewers and listeners, I've chosen an article that I think is going to resonate greatly with you. Uh, so okay. I, have, I must confess, when I've read the article, I went, I'm choosing that one just for my co-host <laughs> and dear friend. <laughs> so the article was written by Matt Barker, who is the features writer for Marketing Week, which is one of our you know, kind of go-to authorities for news and more. Now, Marketing Week organized every year a conference called the Festival of Marketing, they went virtual, as you can imagine, this year. And what Matt was doing was reporting back on some of the speakers. And one of those speakers is a gentleman called Bob Offman. I don't know if you've come across Bob before, but I'm pretty confident he's going to become your new best marketing friend. <laughs> now, Bob delivered a presentation that Matt kind of quickly summarized. It was almost like a post-event content marketing uh, effort, which is you know absolutely the right thing to do. But the time title chosen by Matt, Bob Hoffman, colon, devious at tech whistles are making marketers look like fools. Now, great. Title. you'll understand that with a title like this one, uh, I had to read on. Now, for people listening to, you know, this podcast or watching the video, but also for you, Roger, you may have come across Bob Hoffman or refer to because he's the author of this book, Bad Man, How Advertising Went from a Minor Annoyance to a Major Menace. <laughs> <laughs> and he's also, which is how I came across him, I saw some kind of um, shares on LinkedIn because he's the writer of his own blog series called The Ad Contrarian. Now, obviously, Bob is a marketer. He's an advertiser and is passionate by strong ethics 
honesty, logic, you know, pragmatism, and so on and so forth. And what is it was arguing in a presentation that I so dearly I would have wished to have been there live is saying that the most healthy mindset for any marketer working in the industry today is skepticism. And what mm. it's talking about really is an industry that has been hijacked by people who have little experience to speak of and that forever over promising and under delivering. And also, I think implicitly, because of course, Matt could only give an, an overview. I'm, uh, I'm wondering whether, you know, Bob is also saying that it is time for the silent majority to be more vocal to protect customers from obviously the devious, you know, what's it called? Devious ad tech weasels. So, what I'm going to do now, Roger, is give you some of the snippets that Matt has shared, you know, on behalf of Bob Hoffman. And then, of course, I'm going to get reactions. So, uh, here's a extract from the presentation. The ad agency has allowed itself to crawl into bed with the squids at Facebook and Google <laughs> and the rest of the devious ad tech weasels. It makes us look like fools, you know. And there's a whole kind of sp uh, spiel about essentially advertising agency who either do not know the kind of um, devious and also often um, criminal activities of the big platform r around data protection and data privacy. And if they do know, then they are complicit. Then he moves into this idea of experience and he's asking the question, why is it that we have a, uh, an industry, which I think is mostly advertising, obsessed with young you know, customers when in fact the over 50s have got a bigger disposable income and are yeah. usually often more loyal customers. So this is another extract for you and our viewers and listeners. Go into any marketing or media agency in the world and something immediately become obvious. Everyone's young. It is nothing but narcissism disguised as a strategy. It is marketing by selfie stick. <laughs> and then <laughs> he kind of says, you know, we as an industry have allowed talented people who are now over the age of 40, 50 and more to leave, but we need them because without that experience, you are back to what you and I call text hacks and, and kind of uh, well, as opposed to strategy. So what um, he then moves on to say is for decades, we've been accused of being too hairy-fairy, us the marketers. Our reaction has been to overreact and become data-driven instead of ideas driven. And I love that because I think it's so, so important. You know, the, the spark of an idea is what's going to really kickstart everything, not just um, well put together graphs and, and pie charts. It finishes, or certainly Matt finishes by saying the following on behalf of Bob, we've allowed ourselves to be bamboozled by more than a few clowns masquerading as marketing geniuses. <laughs> so, my question to you is as follows. Do you believe that, of course, experience is important in the world of marketing? Do you believe, as Bob Hoffman is suggesting, that skepticism is healthy as a business leader, as a head of marketing, where you invite a consultant and a so-called marketing genius into your life, but also you know, how we allowed ourselves to just be bamboozled by tech platforms and younger people with little experience? This is, I mean, gosh, <laughs> we could do the rest of the entire show just discussing this topic, Pascal. I mean, I absolutely agree with a lot of what is being said here. And and the themes come up on the show so often because, as you know, I'm, I'm pretty obsessed with all of this. But uh, picking up on a couple of things, there, I, again, I think we have allowed the tech to take over. That's why the marketing profession has become so tactical. You know, we've forgotten how to do the strategy. Um, and and the, the ironic thing is if we still did the strategy, then we wouldn't be doing some of the things that we're doing with our tactics. Now, ironically, I'm actually looking at this article now on my screen as we speak. And I agree with the fact that, you know, we've allowed advertising to become more than annoying. You know, it's a pest. And yet I'm reading this on the Marketing Week screen. And whilst I'm trying to read it, all of these pop-up <laughs> ads are popping up all over the uh, all over the place, which is a little bit ironic. But advertising is annoying. And, you know, if you find it annoying as a marketer, why would you think that your end customer is going to be able to tolerate it? And that's because we've forgotten about the crucial part of marketing, and that is understanding your customers' needs. And customers don't want to be bombarded with all these intrusive, 
horrible pop-up. It's like playing Space Invaders. You have to try to keep zapping these ads before so before they can cover up what you're reading. And I think that's what companies have allowed this, some of these agencies to do. But let, let's not let's not pile all the blame on the agencies. I suspect some of the big companies as well aren't doing the strategy work either. And that just allows the agencies to get away with with what they're doing. And I think this they, this confusion, sorry, Roger, this confusion around for business decision makers, not just marketers, mm -hmm. this confusion around because it's digital, it's a young person's game. This is yes. just utter nonsense. And and I think, obviously, I would like to make sure that people don't misunderstand why to this article. I don't think Bob Hoffman is there to entertain people. He's speaking the truth. What I'm trying to say is maybe others is almost like a, a rallying call for others who have obviously strong ethics and, and, you know, believe that honesty is important to be more vocal as well. Yeah. And, you know, coming back onto that point, your strategy involves deciding who your customer base is, who is our customer, what's their problem, and how do we solve their problem. And I can't believe that every company in the world sits there and says, when they answer that question, our customers are all age 30 and below. I mean, if, if that was the case, we'd, we'd enter into some sort of Logan's Run dystopia, wouldn't we, <laughs> where everybody goes to carousel at the age of 30. Um, you, you, for some people, I mean, imagine you're selling a luxury product, as you said before, has a price tag. You know, there are going to be young people who haven't got the spending power yet to be able to afford that. So why does your marketing effectively target those people? Again, it's a lack of strategy, I think, Pascal. They're not doing the work to identify who the customer is. And if your customer is the over 50s, then market to the over 50s and use over 50s in the advertisements and use over 50s in the drafting. Um, yeah, it is the, It is a cult of youth, I think. And, and yes, I know that people watching this and listening to this could say, well, you two are actually in the older age bracket, so you would say that, wouldn't you? But I'm not trying to get into that here. I'm, I'm trying to get into absolute marketing discipline. A marketing discipline starts with the customer. And, you know, we've got an entire planet of people with different ages, different likes, different dislikes, different needs, different problems. And we can solve all of those problems and then decide how we're going to do the tactics. And then once you want to do the tactics and others from outside you know your circles come up with their hacks and you know solutions skepticism as to whether it's appropriate whether it's going to work and so on and so forth i think is part of the arsenal of being a marketing and sales professional and and i think for me you know the timing of discovering this article is around my own customers being misinformed by mm -hmm. suppliers my own partners so i do as you know a um monthly podcast with Natalie Emery called the Social Media News Roundup and she despairs at the nonsense that you know suppliers out there uh, mm. provide her clients. I had a friend who had to sit through a two-hour marketing presentation from an agency that was just complete nonsense full of uh, bar charts and and kind of uh, mumbo jumbo and, and I think it's just you know we need to be careful you my position it has taken decades for marketing to have a seat at the boardroom table and we're losing it we're losing that place. I think you'll appreciate my content spotlight this week, Pascal, because with your background as a film producer, um, this is all about video editing. Now, I, I've been learning the ropes on video editing for, our last, for the last couple of years now. And of course, you set me up on this journey at a, uh, one of Chris Ducker's masterminds a few years back, where you encouraged me to get out and about and film different angles and, and take different types of shots to, to create a story and to edit them together. And, and I've been learning how to use Premiere Pro and editing techniques and stuff like that. This was actually prompted by a, an inquiry from one of my own um, coaching clients about, you know, how do I get started with video editing? And that prompted me to go to YouTube and, and see if anybody's done something, you know, almost like going back to the basics. And I came across this video and it's called 10 Mistakes New Video Editors Make, i.e. it's a video editors for beginners video and it's by a guy called Justin Brown from Australia and Justin does quite a lot of videos like this 
he helps people to get good at filming. And and he's one of these people that argues, you know, you don't have to have fancy equipment, fancy cameras, that sort of thing. You can do it all on an iPhone if you need to. You can do it all on an Android device if you need to. And he tries to help people to make the best of what they've got. Um, and I just really liked this video because I watched it. And even though I like to pride myself on the fact that I've learned quite a lot about video editing, there were a few things that I thought, oh, yeah, do you know what? It's it's so well worth to be reminded about that. So it's it's about I think it's about 13, 14 minutes long. So it's uh, it's it's absolutely um, snackable. You know, you can you can really get into it and learn from it. And I'm going to take you through a few of those 10 things, if I may. So number one, Pascal, and and again, obviously, you know your your background, you'll 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 um, appreciate these, but be able to add to them, sure. Number one is not thinking of the editing whilst you're filming. Now, again, you know this is one of these ones that I need to read every time I go out with my camera, because you know whether it's a Rog vlog that I'm doing or whether it's a marketing made simple. If you don't have it in your head what you want to achieve, then it's uh, it's absolutely inevitable that you won't take either enough footage or the right footage and then you'll get back you'll be sat down you'll be editing and you think oh do you know what i needed a shot of edinburgh castle from this angle or i needed a shot of me standing at the harbor in a wide in a wide angle or something like this so it's not enough just to think i'm going to go out and make a video you've actually got to know what you're doing in advance to make sure you take all the right shots that when you hit the editing suite you've got everything there that you need and it's so basic isn't it but so important number two no plan and goals i'm not really going to touch any more upon just mentioning that one number three is vitally important and something that took me a long time to learn and that is not having an editing process so for example when i first started editing i'd, I'd dump a load of footage into the editor and that day I may be just thinking oh do you know what I'm going to have a play around with the colour grading so that would be like oh I'd go and start doing the colour grading or another day I'd come in and think I'm going to try making a few sound effects or, or a few special effects so I'll do that and of course that's very very um, impractical and, and it isn't very efficient and what Justin's saying here is you should have a logical order every time you do an editing project so it could be something like this dump your film into the um into the bins and the the editing software and then you effectively uh, put them in the right order that you want to edit them together you then you you chop out the redundant parts then you chop out the mistakes then it may be that you do the color grading then it may be that you add the graphics then it may be that you um, add the special effects and then finally you export it, you render it and, and you finished it. But always do it in the same order. Don't one week decide to start with the sound effects or one week decide to start with the special effects. If you have that logical order, you know, footage, cut the footage, do the color grading, whatever it is, have that order and be efficient. And, it, and, and you know, once I learned that, I just thought that I cut down the time it took me to edit a video by a massive amount. It was it's incredible. Number four, file management. You know, don't worry about creating hundreds of folders if that makes it easy for you to find bits of footage. You know, I, I, again, I often film things, put them in folders and forget where they are and then spend hours trying to locate certain clips. You know, if you take the time to work on your file management, then wow. Number five, use the keyboard shortcuts. Use the keyboard shortcuts. I mean, I, again, I, I, I'm admitting to this. It's only literally in the last couple of weeks that I've realized that Control Z is an, is an instant undo of what you've just done. Whereas before I might have deleted something, I'll go file, edit, undo, you know, and that takes, okay, it takes five, five, six seconds to do, but control Z, bang, and it's there, it's done. Learn the shortcuts. It's so, so easy and it speeds things up. Number six, don't use the wrong sort of music. You know, it's very easy to go into your epidemic sound or or the the YouTube free stuff that you were talking about last week, Pascal, and choose something and then try to work your video around that. It, it's very important to spend some time choosing the piece of music that you want to use. 
And sometimes you might not need music. Sometimes it needs to be quiet. Sometimes it may need to be louder. But take the time to choose the music. Number seven, and again, this is very important, over-editing. And what Justin means here is don't use all the fancy transitions that are in Premiere Pro, you know, wipes and zoom-ins and zoom-outs. Sometimes just a, a plain cut or a crossfade is all that you need. And don't overthink it. Have a look at some of your favourite YouTube vloggers, your favourite YouTube filmmakers, even your favourite film directors, you know, Steven Spielberg, whoever it might be, and look at what they do. And sometimes you'll realise that it's so simple what they do. You don't need to overcomplicate it. Number eight, back it up. Oh, how many times? <laughs> how many times? You know, again, I'm guilty of this. There'll become a time and I'll realise my sequence has become corrupted. And then that means I've got to come out of the editing software. I've got to try and create a new project and input the sequence from the corrupted project. And sometimes it doesn't work. So, you know, it's not just a question of saving what you're doing. It's saving, you, it's renaming your sequences and creating backups as you go along. Number nine, don't convince yourself that you've got the wrong software all the time. You know, oh, uh, Premiere Pro doesn't do this, so I'll go and use um, After Effects or whatever it might be. It's worth trying to stay with what works for you because the grass isn't always greener on the other side. And the final one, and again, so obvious, if you're doing a lot of headshot videos or uh, marketing made simple in my cases, leave yourself clues whilst you're filming. You know, if it takes you five takes to get a specific bit right, actually say in the video just before you do your fifth take, this is going to be the one that works, or sorry, after your fifth take, that was the one, and maybe clap your hands just so that you've, you're drawing attention to yourself when you're editing the video and it will save you so much time. So there you go, Pascal, 10 editing tips for beginners. Now, as the experienced film guy, what do you reckon to that? I like it a lot. And particularly, I will say number four, because mm -hmm. this is a one that I, I kind of got inspired to do well, folder systems, but also naming the files, which yes. I know is boring. It's admin. It doesn't, it's not only as excited as being out and about and filming, but when you file away and name carefully, you're going to save minutes, which will become hours, which will become days, very much like the, the keyboard shortcuts. And I think that's really quite important. But what is nice as well about this, so to, to begin with, Justin Brand does an amazing job for the last few years now he's been really really sharing great practical advice for video markers but also uh, people that want to work with video editors so yeah. this list could also be what you need to be aware of as a customer to support your editor um, which yes. i think is going to be very very, very important but uh, the other thing as well is back to the editing and of course those platforms i think can't have been designed by editors because some of them are just too <laughs> fancy. There's just too many transitions, too many of this, too many of that, and you spend hours just you know uh, playing with something where, in fact, what you had done in the first time round was was fine. Because to your point, if you watch films where back in the days they were edited with scissors and glue, there's no fancy transitions. You know, it's, it's, transition is done by the camera movement, but there's mm. no fancy cut. There's no fancy this. I mean, uh, yeah, okay, there's part of the Star Wars language about the the wipe or the swipe whatever they're called but um i think my, my recommendation back on one that one you mentioned about backup whichever software you use spend a bit of time to discover the auto save function yes <laughs> you will thank roger and i so it's hidden away somewhere in the settings where literally every minute or so there'll be a backup copy of whatever you're doing because i've been caught up particularly when i was working on fiction work where you suddenly get sucked in into the editing process which i'm sure you've been there and an hour goes by just like this as people will know and you forget to save the, your work and then something happened usually for me because i was pushing my poor computer so hard <laughs> would be the blue screen of death and then of course the last hour is gone unless again you had the auto save and you may only have lost you know 10 minutes or a quarter of an hour of your of your editing but no so both a wonderful selection in terms of justin brown's contribution to video editing and marketing and i think those top 10 is a great reminder for the editors but also the customers of video editors 
Thank you so much for that, Pascal. I, I knew I knew you'd like it. I knew you'd like it, despite your experience. So again, some great content spotlights there this week. And I guess we've been talking about editing software. That's technology. And technology is the subject of our next sequence in the show. So shall we move on now to marketing tech and apps? In this section of the show, Pascal and I review our latest favourite marketing tech and apps. And again, we don't know what each of us is bringing to the table. So, Pascal, hit me with your apps for this week. Okay, so today the theme is about webcams or, what should I say, internal webcams that do not work so well on a computer. So I had a conversation recently with a guest of mine where we just were very disappointed by it the way we looked on, on the Zoom call. And, and obviously you can buy different webcams and you can plug things in and so on. But we thought, why is it that the native webcams you get on the laptop um, you know, work so poorly? And it basically it's because the manufacturers have not bothered to invest in the tech. So I am a MacBook user. My guest from a, a few days ago was a PC laptop user. So I've been thinking, right, I need to get an answer to that. So if you are a MacBook user and like me, you think, you know, this is 2021, I should look much better. Although I look a bit older than I did a few years ago. But, you know, there's the issue with contrast. Uh, sometime, different times of the day, you know, the light conditions is different, but you look very different. It's very, very frustrating. So there is a company called Ecam that um, MacBook users will be familiar with because, of course, they are the creator of the call recorder for Skype, but also Ecam Live. Now, they have a tucked away product or software update called iGlasses. Mm -hmm. I suppose inspired by the iPhone and iMac type of language. So iGlasses is a software you download on your machine that allows you to control the performance of the MacBook webcam. So you can control the contrast, you can control the color saturations, you can do a number of things that just helps, you know, a poorly kind of created manufactured webcam to do a bit better now obviously this is for mac users there's a free trial period and then you can buy the software for 20 dollars, which i think is a very very fair investment for both pc users and um, laptop users and macbook users and the likes there is something called many cam which you may be aware of because they do appear a lot uh, as adverts and recommendation by bloggers out there so many ca many cam or one word is a um, platform that allows you to, again, control your webcam performance in terms of lights and contrast and more, but also do other things such as adding text, adding maybe picture on picture, doing things that can uh, essentially add interest during a live session. Again, they have a free trial period and then you can buy the software. So you know, depending on what you need, if you need just simple kind of manipulation, the performance of your webcam and you have a MacBook user, I think iGlasses is fine. If you want to do more than that and add some elements of interaction and visual interest to what you do, then I think Minicam would be a, a good addition to your little toolkit. Very interesting, Pascal. I'm definitely, definitely going to check out Minicam. Obviously, I, I don't have a macbook computer um I, i'm still on pc so many cam is the option mm. i would have to look at but that really sounds quite interesting because whilst i'm happy with the overall quality of my logitech webcam i often find that the settings aren't ideal and, and yes they do have their own native program that controls that but it's it it, it, it just doesn't squeeze the best out of the webcam I, d I don't think so i shall check that out now last week my uh, shout outs for tech and apps were based around writing and i'm continuing that particular uh, avenue this okay. week if i may so this is um a, a lot of people use a piece of software called grammarly which i think um, is is quite common to check the grammar that they put into their writing and and grammarly is okay i in fact i i subscribed to grammarly for many years paid their full price uh, i do find it a little bit intrusive and there's it, it does some really quite annoying things which i even wrote to them about at the time and and uh, never got a response but sometimes the pop-ups that come with grammarly to tell you that you're doing something wrong are so close to the thing that you're trying to check that you then have to change that you can't actually change the thing that it's telling you you have to change and that's really annoying um and 
I sort of decided not to renew my Grammarly subscription and, and I haven't used it since. Now, I came across the other day something new. It's called Ginger Software or just Ginger for short. And this is a browser-based equivalent of Grammarly. And from what I can see, it does a very similar job, but in a much less annoying and a much more uh, constructive way. And it's got a really interesting um, functionality, which is called rephrase. Now, I think I mentioned last week that sometimes, you know, you, you, you often use certain words all the time, like it's a beautiful day. And sometimes it's nice to be reminded of synonyms and different ways of saying things. And, and yes, you could use a thesaurus or you could use a synonym generator. But this one, Ginger, actually has the ability to rephrase whole sentences. And it does a really interesting job of it, Pascal. So even from that point of view, if you th write something and just think, you know, I'm not just not quite sure I'm happy with that sentence. And, 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 and think this could be in a tweet or it could be in an Instagram post. It doesn't need to be in a big uh, block of prose. Hit that rephrase and it'll give you some really interesting alternatives. So it's worth having a look at just for that rephrase uh, functionality. The second one, um, I came across this many years ago and it was one of those things that I sort of forgot about. It's called Portents content idea generator and as the name would suggest it's again it's a browser-based system you go on and you put in a keyword or a key sentence so marketing for example and it will generate for you a load of different headlines and you could then turn those headlines into blog posts into videos into podcast whatever it might be and some, it is quite interesting because you put the word marketing in and, and, and sometimes it, it's obviously got access to hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands of alternative titles. And there's obviously some AI going on in the background that comes up with um, a title based upon the word that you put in. But sometimes, very occasionally, it gets it very wrong. Like uh, what are the best ways of serving marketing on toast, for example, is, is obviously total and utter nonsense, but it makes you laugh. But what I find about this isn't the fact that I'm totally at a loss for ideas of things to write about, but it's just having that different way. Oh, that's I hadn't thought about it like that. Well, that just gives you a spark and it sends you off in a different direction. And I think sometimes just having that wham, something completely new, even if it is marketing on toast, it just gives you a new perspective and it just might spark something creative. So try it, Portent Content Idea Generator. And as always, the links will be down there in the show notes. Like them both a lot, particularly the rephrase, because I think you're right. This is a more kind of uh, a more helpful companion than Grammarly in general, because I think Grammarly you, you get told off pretty much. That's that's what happens. Whereas <laughs> yeah. at least with rephrase, you're getting some real support. And I love the idea generator, but bear in mind, you know, my content spotlight, where we need to move away from data driven to become more ideas driven again. We all need a nerd. We all need a little kind of, you know, spark. You're right. The thing about, you know, marketing on toast could just certainly trigger a thought process that leads you to the next video or podcast or article. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, yeah I, I really enjoyed it. Again, it's one of those things where you just keep pressing the button to see what the next title is going to be. Just for, <laughs> just because it's it's good. It's good. I love it. So, Pascal, it's time for us to get wibbly wobbly, timey wimey and talk about what happened in the past. Shall we go back to This Week in History? And in 1912, the RMS Titanic embarked on its maiden voyage, which ended in the tragedy four days later when the luxury liner struck an iceberg and sank. In 1954, Bill Haley and the Comets recorded Rock Around the Clock. Wow. In 1961, Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin becomes the first person to orbit Earth in the Vostok 3KA space capsule. And staying in space, in 1970, Apollo 13 was launched, and it soon turned into a nerve-wracking few days trying to get those astronauts home. Do you remember the famous broadcast, Houston, we have a problem? In 1988, Cher wins the Best Actress Oscar for Moonstruck at the 16th Annual Academy Awards Ceremony. 
in 1998, the Good Friday Agreement was signed, calling for devolved government in Northern Ireland. The accord was ratified by Ireland and Northern Ireland the following month. In 2012, Roger, The Avengers, directed by Josh Whedon and starring Robert Downey Jr., Chris Evans, Quince Hemsworth, Scarlett Johansson, Mark Ruffalo and Jeremy Renner premieres in Los Angeles. Fantastic. And in 2019, astronomers released the first ever image of a black hole, which is in the centre of the massive galaxy M87. So April is a very, you know, <laughs> space-focused month across, you know, very the human history. Very space-focused. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the astronomers, the, the, the Apollo 13, the Yuri Gagarin, all of, and even Bill Haley and the Comets is, is space-orientated, <laughs> isn't it? It's well, a shame that the, t the Titanic didn't yeah. uh, get sucked up into a black hole or something just to, uh, to make a difference. But uh, I can't believe that, again... Avengers is nearly a decade old. The very f well, the first one where you know our superheroes and um, modern kind of um, you know heroes from the the legends from Greek and, and Latin origins come together. But what what is interesting for me, 2012. So you've got you know 1912 Titanic and uh, 2012 the, the Avengers. You know a century goes by with Titanic. You know it's still to this day a story that feels so tragic and because of course you know we had the inventors of you know titanic saying yep. we're going to be able to cross the atlantic in record time and so on and so forth we had obviously passengers and, and the movie or different movies including the last one uh, by james cameron you know kind of tell the story well and it feels this kind of really really morbid uh, kind of tragedy around now nah, we're going to stop you in your tracks here yeah, and again, it, the lesson from the Titanic itself was that, you know, I used to, I used to get quite upset when I used to work in big corporate and we used to have to do all these sort of scenario planning exercises where what happens if a meteorite lands on Edinburgh or what happens if there's a global pandemic or what happens if there's a an alien invasion? And, and yet you think they obviously scenario planned various different things things happening to titanic but they just didn't believe that it was sinkable did they mm. and had they scenario planned they would have installed bulkheads that went all the way up to the top of the ship as opposed to i can't remember exactly but the, the bulkheads only went two-thirds of the way up and that's because that's what made it sink because the hole was big enough for the water to go inside and, and flow over the bulkheads and effectively as soon as that happened the ship was it was definitely going to sink. And, you know, somebody signed off on that design and created that scenario, however unlikely it was that it was, it was doomed. Um, and again, I, you know, today you, you learn from your mistakes, but that was a massive mistake to learn from. Absolutely. Moving on to the next item that you read about Bill Haley and the comets. Am I right in thinking this was the song for Happy Days, the TV series? Ah, now that's very interesting. I think you're absolutely right. Um, although, and I would have to check, I think it was the theme song for maybe the first series of Happy Days or the first couple of series of that until they actually introduced the Happy Days song yeah. itself. But yeah, definitely, definitely remember seeing early episodes of Happy Days, which had that as the uh, as the theme tune. That or Can't believe maybe, it's 54. Oh, I know, <laughs> with a very young uh, Ron Howard and um, was it Henry Winkler playing the phone? That's right, and that's right. It was on a Sunday evening just before bedtime in France. I remember that vividly. Maybe the run, Rock Run the Clock was maybe for the closing credits, but, you know, um, people who know uh, should get in touch with, with the show and let us know you know about what that is but then i'm thinking about yuri gangarin i mean probably one of the most famous russian in the world but do you remember do you imagine being in that briefing session where, where when you people say we're going to put you in a space capsule not a spaceship not a space shuttle not you know a capsule that that word just makes makes me shudder thinking what a brave man indeed yeah <laughs> to be fired into the into the sky i mean obviously incredible experience for him but you can't tell me that he wasn't just a little bit frightened by what was happening 
my reaction when um I read uh, you know about Cher winning the Best Actress Oscar. I was thinking, what an achievement! Because she's not had a long film career. I mean, she's done great films. One of my all-time guilty pleasure are uh, uh, the Witches of Eastwick. But the um, what a person in terms of personal branding and how she's controlled that most of her career. Yeah, I mean, again, she's been around for a long time, mainly <laughs> as a, as a singer, hasn't yeah, she? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, she reinvented herself many times as a vocal artist. Uh, I can remember the uh, Do You Believe in Life After Love, that one with all the weird electronic effects in it. And I can remember that coming out. And she was pretty much slated, as far as I can remember, by the music critics at the time, saying, what is this woman doing? You know, she's moved so far away from her roots. But she pulled it off and extended her career by almost a decade by doing that. And again, I, there's a few films that I, uh, like Mermaids, for example, which has Bob Hoskins in it and um, um, other people, and share a great film, absolutely great film. And she was in a film as well called Mask, where she was the mother of a, of a boy who had some That's sort right. of um, fa facial yeah. disfiguration. Mm -hmm. uh, great films. She's one of those people who you forget she was an actress as well as a singer, although maybe we shouldn't talk about her role in the sequel to Mamma Mia, which I thought was <laughs> <laughs> was pretty di dismal, mm, but uh, yes. we, we won't go there. We won't go there. So lots of great news happening there in the past, and I just love the fact that there was a bit of a space theme to that. Pascal, we have creators that we need to do shout outs for. In this section of the show, Pascal and I give shout outs to our favorite creators. Now, usually these are people who are sort of within our network, maybe slightly outside of the network, but usually people that we know and we interact with. So, Pascal, who's in your spotlight this week. So this week, long overdue, my shout out is for Joe Glover, the host of the Marketing Meetup webinar series. Now, Joe is a marketer, so already, you know, tick in around the box, but he's also been instrumental in creating a bit of movement with this trap line, positively lovely online marketing events and suddenly that summarizes everything that Joe stands for but also of course the many participants to the webinars. Now the marketing meetup started I would say maybe five six years ago Roger as physical get-togethers started around his um, local area of Cambridge if memory serves and then has grown around the UK and, and then has gone across the US and so on but of course with the pandemic has had to change and switch to online events. The marketing meetups webinar series take place usually on a Wednesday morning 8 30 perfect way to start your day with a coffee and listening to a chat from real practitioners passionate about what they do and of course doing marketing the right way so I'm going to put the, the links into the into the show notes, but I wanted to kind of really make sure that people knew about Joe, who's put an enormous amount of effort to now get a not just a meetup as we want to say, but it's a movement where people who want to have lovely conversations with lovely people and really do it in a positive way, because you and I know that there is all sorts happening out there in the world, and particularly you know on on the interweb. But if you want a place where it's all about positivity and feeling great uh, about your profession as a marketer, then Joe Glover is really, really the man you want to seek out. F fantastic. I've, I've seen a few of those videos and it's, it's uh, those meetups. It's great, great stuff. Well worth checking out. So, Pascal, my shout out is also long overdue. I want to give a shout out to Pete Matthew. Ah. Now, Pete Matthew is... Uh, a financial advisor. He runs a company called Jackson's Wealth down in Penzance, the opposite end of the country to where I live. And over a decade ago, Pete stood on the front at Penzance with a cheap video camera, probably a standard definition video camera, and shot his first video explaining financial terms in simple language. And he, he put together quite a few hundred videos in those early days. So he's genuinely one of the first video content content creators. Now, obviously, financial services is quite a niche and it's quite a complicated industry. And he gained lots of plaudits from becoming 
one of the first people to try and explain financial services in a simple manner. He pivoted from doing video um, after a few years and launched a podcast called the Meaningful Money Podcast. And, th and this has become one of the most popular finance podcasts in the world. And again, it's aimed at the man on the street who doesn't un understand finance, and he just tells it in a really easy to understand way. But the reason for the shout out really is that I noticed that recently Pete sort of veered back to doing more video again. Now he still ha he still does the podcast. He's also written a book called The Meaningful Money Book as well. Uh, but he's doing a lot more video again. And <laughs> it's just nice to show you know, look way back to that first video on the front at Penzance where the wind was howling and the <laughs> camera was sh uh, was shuddering to the incredible production that he's putting into these videos now, obviously with his, his lighting and his cameras and his angles and his scripting. It's just great. And the latest video, whilst it has a financial theme, is actually all about how you can use checklists in your life to make you much more um, efficient and a lot more productive. So I just love that journey that Pete's been on. And yes, he's a financial advisor, but he's also one of the most prolific content creators there is. And I think that he is he just defines what content marketing is all about. And And the thing is, he will be the first to admit, he never went into this with the intention of becoming a content marketing expert, but by virtue of what he's done, he has become a content marketing expert. And I think that is just fantastic. So Pete, long overdue shout out for you here on Two Geeks in a Marketing Podcast. And the same for Joe Glover. Absolutely right. All right, Pascal, it's that part of the show which we always get revved up about. We always get excited about. We are going to head into our film marketing section. So, Roger Edwards, a yes. few weeks ago, we reviewed the marketing of The Lost Boys, and you declared that that was a movie that made it cool to be a vampire. And in yes. fact, you wanted to be a vampire following watching The Lost Boys. I'm going to argue that today's film, Blade, proves that it is cool to be a vampire, whether you are a good vampire, as the Day Walker, or a bad vampire as Deacon Frost. Yeah, it's an interesting one because obviously in Lost Boys, it was a couple of young kids with uh, makeshift makeshift crosses and uh, baths full of garlic that defeated the vampires. Whereas in Blade, the vampires have got this gigantic bloke in a great big long black coat with shades on, with armor armor plating and a great big sword chasing them down. So I'm not sure it's as cool to be a vampire in Blade when you've got him coming after you <laughs> as it was in Lost Boys when all you do is hang around uh, fairgrounds picking up pretty girls and uh, and uh, and feeding off the blood of the locals. But but yeah, it, it is another of those films which does try to turn vampirism into something cool. And that's reflected in the music of the film. It's reflected in the style. You know, it's it was a good decade after Lost Boys, but I can still see quite a lot of parallels in the visuals and in the, in the, the way that they put it together. Um, now, I've got an admission to make here, Pascal. I watched this last night in preparation okay. mm -hmm. for today's podcast and i went into watching it fully thinking that this is actually just a refresher so that i can talk about this with pascal tomorrow and i watched the start and there's this incredibly iconic opening set in a nightclub and the music is incredible the atmosphere is incredible and there's an amazing fight sequence but after that <laughs> there was a lot about the film which i'm thinking i just don't recognize this I don't know whether I've actually seen this. Now, don't get me wrong, I enjoyed every single minute of it. It's a fabulous film, and I would quite happily watch it again tonight. Action-packed, great characters, great visuals, great special effects, great music. But I do wonder now whether somehow <laughs> I actually missed it way back when it first came out in 1998. Well, thank you for the confession. 
and I shall <laughs> think, and the viewers and listeners we shall think of a rightful, you know, punishment because how <laughs> did you miss this? How did I miss this it? This was a 1998, you know, success story of all success stories when really this was a low to medium, you know, size budget film. But everybody talked about it, and we will talk about the marketing bit and how they exploited PR, you know, to its full. But you know, here we are, where vampires are essentially wealthy; they are in every part of society, from the police to oil company to tech companies and so on. But they are very discreet. But as is often the case in stories, there is, you know, in a, a disruption comes from the younger generation yes. of vampires led by Deacon Frost, who says, hang on a minute, humans are our food. Let's stop hiding in the shadows and take over the world. And they've got that, therefore, conflict internally within the, within the vampire ranks. And of course, they are being chased by the character Blade, played by Wesley Snipes, and his mentor Whistler, played by Christopher Christopherson. Absolutely. And uh, Chris Christopherson, great, great character actor. I remember him being in a film called Convoy many, many, oh, many yeah, years yeah, ago about, uh, about lorry drivers. But uh, yeah, I mean, Wesley Snipes looks incredibly cool in this film, doesn't he? As I say, the, the, um, the image of him in that long, dark coat. He's got the heavy-duty armour on. He's got the sword with all the, the fancy things that keep snapping out of it and the cool shades. And he's, and he's just got that power and demeanour about him. And he's an incredible martial artist as well. I mean, some of the martial arts fighting sequences in this film are remarkable, absolutely remarkable. And again, I, I think I said this when we when we were talking about Lost Boys, every vampire film and every vampire TV series just rewrites vampire lore a little bit to fit with the, what they wanted to get out of it. So I think in this film, the vampires can't go out in daylight and, and they can be affected by um, garlic and they can be killed by silver, but crosses don't affect them in this film. Um, so that that that's quite interesting. But one thing that I've never come across in a vampire movie before, and that this is the dif the difference between some of the older vampires in this, who apparently were born as vampires, as opposed to the younger one, who was actually converted from a human to a vampire. So I have this image in my head of actual vampire babies being born. I don't know whether that's wrong or not. No, but I think that's what was interesting. So this is based, obviously, on a graphic novel that yes. was produced by the Marvel brand. So here's the thing as well. Now, in 1998, we didn't really appreciate that. That came much, much later. But this is the first Marvel adaptation to the big screen of a comic book graphic novel character. Normally, people always say, oh, Iron Man 2008 was it, you know, the first adaptation, but because they forget about Blade, because it was never really used as part of the, the marketing campaign. And very often people will say, oh, isn't Black Panther amazing in 2018 because it had a lead actor that was black? I said, well, I'm sorry, what about Blade 20 years mm. prior? So mm. I think what, what is also very interesting is that there was some um, assets that the marketing campaign could have used that wasn't used because it just didn't come to mind at the time that this was such a significant movie production, the first adaptation of a character from a graphic novel from the Marvel Universe. Yeah, and of course, all the Marvel films, Iron Man onwards, have that Marvel sort of introduction, don't they? Where mm. it sort of goes fast forward through a lot of the uh, the comics, and, and that became an iconic way to introduce each film. Whereas this, obviously, it, 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 it wasn't. But technically, does that mean that Blade could have turned up within? other Marvel films then? Well, funny enough, you should ask the question, Monsieur Roger Edwards, because they are looking to reboot Blade as uh -huh. a storyline franchise with a blessing of what is it, a Snipes, who will just have a cameo. They're looking for a new actor. And yes, Blade will appear within you know what we now know to be the MCU. But there is a problem. And the problem is as follows, which is Blade is 18 rated. This is a movie for adults, I would argue, because mm. of the storyline is complex, the action, the violence, the blood, the explosions, and so on and so forth, the language primarily by the character of Whistler. And I just don't know because I think most of the Marvel movies are either 12 or 15 rated. So ah. I think they have a problem. And I want Blade to remain like Blade. I mean, I don't want it to become Blade Light. 
No, you're absolutely right. I mean, I did notice again last night, some of Wesley Snipes' lines reminded me of Jules in Pulp Fiction. Um, and I think Pulp Fiction was about four years before Blade. Uh, but I, there's there's one line where he says something like, aim for the, the head or, or aim for the heart. But if you miss, that means your ass. <laughs> and I thought, oh, Jules yeah. would have said that in, in Pulp Fiction. Um, but uh, yeah, I can, I, can, I can fully agree with you. Blade benefited from being an, a movie for adults in the special. I mean, it's quite gory, isn't it? In the special effects, it's quite a violent film. The uh, the martial arts work is tip top. I think absolutely, mm. you know, it's proper. You know, they're hurting each other when they're hitting each other, and uh, it would be a shame to dilute it. Definitely. Oh, I mean, you, you give me segues into so many things I want to talk about. So to begin with, <laughs> the writing. Let's you know give David S. Goya you know really a big applause because I think that's why Blade works so well. It was very very well written and written with a view of creating uh, a world of vampires that we've not seen before so mm -hmm. we, we i mentioned a moment ago that they are part of society they just you know do it very discreetly but we learn about you know the, the house of erebus they have their own language yes. there is obviously the prophecy of la magra and the the blood god you've got all sort of things that frankly uh, prior to Blade, there was never that depth of looking into the world of vampires. And as you said, the difference between being a pure blood and someone's been bitten, which is, by the way, one well, of the motivation of the villain, Deacon Frost, is yeah. not a pure blood. He wants a seat at the table of the House the of Erebus and is denied that, and therefore he's going to take matters in his own hand. But you know, David S. Goya, you know, wrote Dark City, one of my you know, all-time kind of again uh, guilty pleasures when it comes to sci-fi movies. Is behind Batman Begins, is behind The Man of Steel, Terminator, Dark Fate, and so on. And in fact, many fans are suggesting that if you look at Dark City and Blade. Made, they are in some ways paving the grounds for the matrix yes that's right and 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 again you know the argument of wesley snipes with his black glasses on and his long black coat <laughs> was very matrix matrix esque wasn't it what is lovely is that the director was not necessarily someone that had a long track record. Stephen Norrington from the UK, hooray. And yep. he has a background in set design and special effects, which I think served the movie really well because the use of the urban landscape, uh, both uh, kind of indoors and outdoor, and when they go into the underground library to meet the character of Pearl, the bookkeeper, I mm. think that's really well designed as well, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah, and the, and the final set in the um, it al almost yes. looked like a, a gothic missile chamber to me, mm. um, where the the final fight takes place. Incredible piece Incredible. of set design. They really yeah. squeezed yeah. every single pound from that budget, you know. But Absolutely. what is what is lovely as well is you're right. It really did showcase martial arts, so uh, which helped, I think, the marketing. We're going to come on to in a minute. I do promise our viewers and listeners. So. <laughs> I mean, obviously, we know because of this biography that Wesley Snipes is an accomplished martial artist. He has a keen interest in Shotokan Karate, Apkido, but also has tried his hand in, in Jiu-Jitsu and mixed martial arts and so on. Because Blade, as a character, he has to move right. So yes. do you mean understand when, you know, when David S. Goya and Stephen Norrington was told by the studios, well, what about Denzel Washington instead of Wesley Snipes so we can make more money? They must have just gone, no. I mean, we love Denzel. I love, you love Denzel, Roger, but you need a martial artist to pull this off. And if you've looked at Wesley Snipes' you know, kind of uh, filmography from Streets of Gold all the way to U.S. Marshals, Passage of 57 and more, The Munchin Man, you knew that there was, on, there was the only option but to ask him to be played. Absolutely right. No, it would have been, it would not have been <laughs> the film it was had it been uh, the other guy. <laughs> so... We better talk about the marketing, I think, Pascal. <laughs> so let's do that. Um, for me, what is lovely about Blade, and because at the time it was made 1998, the option was very simple. 100% pure old-fashioned public relations, and mm -hmm. they nailed it. And to me, that is also a lesson for modern marketers. We do not do 
enough PR, and I can imagine PR agents and professionals uploading this, but I think that what they did so well is whilst they, of course, created the film that we now know, and the long film for the Times, you know, two hours, which is mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. already breaking boundaries, they went all in on the PR, because what else was there, Roger? Of course, you had the, 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 the poster, just one, which was very clever, and a very good trailer, but they went all in on the PR. Yeah, I mean, yeah, let, 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 let's just give a shout out for the the tagline as well fabulous tagline the power of an immortal the soul of a human the heart of a hero that is great copy isn't it it's the rule of three copy. it always works yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's funny do you know I'm, I'm i'm thinking back now this is episode 36 of two geeks and we don't we haven't really talked about pr much have we um and and this is ironic because when I was marketing director in big corporate, PR was actually one of the things that I enjoyed most about my job. I used to love getting out and talking to journalists and, and getting in touch with publications and putting together press releases and that sort of thing. And yes, I guess a lot of people forget that PR is part of the marketing mix. Um, I deliberately wrote a chapter on PR in my book, Cats, Mats and Marketing Plans, but it does tend to get overlooked, doesn't it? Mm. I started as a young marketing officer, as you know, in London, in the travel industry, and PR was it. I mean, yes, we mm -hmm. advertised mm -hmm. in on CFAX, if you remember those days. Yes, we did, you know, work with the travel agents, and, so, and we did advertising, but PR, briefing travel journalists, you know, taking people uh, to the different destinations so that they can review them in their magazines. So what they could do with Blade was obviously target different audiences. So mm -hmm. the martial arts community, you can imagine, couldn't wait so... I was reading at the time in the UK, there was a magazine called Impact Magazine. Right. Actually, claim to fame, Chris Ducker and I used to write articles for Impact Magazine reviewing <laughs> uh, Hong Kong movies. So, um, But movies in and around martial arts from you know Impact to Martial Arts Illustrated to Kung Fu Illustrated in the US and so on, interviewed, was it Stan, but interviewed also the uh, martial arts or, uh, or screen fighting designer, Jeff Imada, uh, who's really well known in Los Angeles. But of course, part of... Um, what was lovely for Blade is most of the bad vampires, the, the henchmen as they are listed in the credits, were screen fighters from Hollywood and Los Angeles. So yes. you could almost take pleasure in spotting J.J. Perry and Simon Ree uh, and Jeffy Mada and a few others. Indeed, even um, Stephen Norrington um, is one of the vampires in the nightclub with the infamous bloodbath uh, uh, kind of uh, fare. So you have that targeting. Then they're targeting, of course, um, goth and people who dress mm -hmm. using leather. What well, wouldn't you? Then you have those who <laughs> like weapons. Then you've got, of course, vampire fans, horror fans. You name it, they just went for it. And what was important is everybody within the, the cast and crew made themselves available for TV interviews, radio interviews, and print media interviews, so much so that they could declare how much they enjoy working on the film, which I think is also an important message because all too often, Roger, we hear people having a rough time making movies, mm. but those mm. guys had a blast. But wouldn't you? <laughs> Absolutely. And, and am I right in thinking that they actually, as part of the PR campaigns, they, they had a load of vampire parties all over America? <laughs> yeah. So again, good PR stunt, you know, to be reported yeah. back and inviting all, all the right people. And what is lovely, of course, is... It, uh, uh, 10 years later, 20 years later, the cast and crew still talk about the film. People write articles, do video reviews. The 4K um, box set was released uh, for Christmas last year. So yeah. as a movie, the first Marvel adaptation, 1998, I think it's done really well. It stood the test of time, you know, mm. and like, like, like vampires are immortal. <laughs> Blade, Blade has become almost like immortal itself, hasn't it? Yeah. I mean, as I say, Pascal, last night I watched this and thought, I'm sure I, I was convinced I'd seen this and, and maybe the film I was thinking about was Underworld, which is another similar mm. type of gothic type vampire werewolf film, which I'm sure we'll get round to reviewing on the show at some point in the future. But I thoroughly enjoyed it last night. So whether my memory is cheating and whether I did watch it all those years ago and for some reason I've just forgotten about it or not, it is one of the best action films, one of the best horror films, one of the best vampire films there is. And it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you about it today. 
Thank you, everybody, once again for tuning in to Two Geeks and a Marketing Podcast. Whether you listen to this, whether you watch this, we really do appreciate you taking the time to soaking up our passion for marketing and our passion for films. And please do, if you've got any comments that you want to make, if you've got any questions you want to ask us, just pop a comment in to the YouTube channel or hit us up on the uh, on, on Twitter or whatever it might be. And that is it for this week, Pascal, I think. Thank you for watching, everybody. Please make sure that you go out there and make sure that your marketing is done right. See you later. My name is Roger Edwards, and he was Pascal Fintoni.